We're good? Okay. Uh, blessings, everyone. We, um, I want to, we're going to continue on uh, with the feast. Eli Osiris, can you put up Leviticus 23, 2? Blessings. Blessings. I want to make a public apology. This is recorded. She already knows where it's going. I kept calling Sister Carolina Carmen last week, and I want to apologize. I kept seeing a C in, the, in your name, and every time I said it, the Lord was like, that's not it, so I apologize. <laughs> I know. Oh, and I was saying it with, every time I said Sister Carmen, I was saying it with more and more confidence. That's why I need Jesus. Um, we are studying the feasts. I want to just review and then I want to um, try to move through all of the feasts today so we can um, move forward to 2 Corinthians. Um, we got to the feasts because we were studying the book of Corinthians when we got to the end of 1 Corinthians in chapter 16, Paul was talking about the Feast of Weeks and then that triggered us through the Holy Spirit to research what the feasts are and things of the sort. Thank you, brother. And things of the sort. Once we got down the road of studying the feast, it was just like one thing after another and we went on this rabbit trail and now I want to, I want to finish. I want to finish and I want to move forward. Uh, remember that uh, Leviticus 23.2, I went through two weeks of uh, persecution and it's, it's difficult, but it is biblical and it's, it's what's going to happen when you're preaching the truth. I went through um, somebody uh, telling me that I was going to lose my church if I continued to um, teach the commandments. Uh, I know that that wasn't the Lord because God doesn't speak like that. God, because the church belongs to the Lord, right? So God is not going to tell me that I'm going to lose something that belongs to him. He doesn't warn you in that way, per se. Um, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and unseen things. The same way that Jesus, that Peter told Jesus, you know, don't go to Jerusalem. And the, the enemy uses people to get you to stop, right? He doesn't. The same way God uses people to move you, the enemy uses people to stop you. And that's just the way that it is. Um, and uh, I'm comfortable with it because this is what we're called to do. In this church, I've said it many times before, we have a, a mission. And our, our mission is, is to get into the depths of scripture, not the superficial stuff that we are, we're all taught. And we just kind of repeat, starting with me. When I started this church, all of these things that I'm learning... Now, with you, I didn't know them before, and I, and I used to discard them like many people um, may be doing now or may have been doing it and have stopped. But I'm very proud of this class because you're going back and you're researching the things on your own. I can tell by the conversations that I'm having in private, and the Holy Spirit is confirming it to each of you one-on-one. -on -one. We all come to different levels of understanding, right? Nobody knows the Word of God more than the Lord. So let's just start right there, right? We all fall short of the knowledge of God in comparison to God. Now, the, the, the other time that I was persecuted, um, I was finally called a false teacher. And uh, I thought that that was um, very interesting as well. And again, we've been taught, we, I'm generalizing it, that the Old Testament has nothing to do with the New Testament. We've been taught that the Old Testament, that that was for a people, that was for a time. That's not true because the Bible doesn't say that. It's all the same thing. It's all the same law, okay? What's old and new is not the old law and the new law. What's old and new is the way that it's ministered. The old way, it was through a Levitical priest with um, the killing of, of sacrificing of animals so that we could get grace and now the new part of the new law is now Jesus is the high priest and the final sacrifice amen a lot of times because these two brothers that were that were um, trying to warn me and I know that they thought that they were trying to help me but they weren't 
They were saying the same things that I was saying when I came to this fork in the road. And I want to challenge you that every time you find a scripture that says that we're not under law, it's true. We're not. But it's for justification. It's to be saved. Like you cannot do anything to be saved. Nothing. It's, it's, by, it's a gift from God. It's, a, it's by grace alone. Now, because you're saved, there should be something that is produced out of you, right? If you love someone, they will, you will tell that that person loves you. Um, so that's where the word sanctification comes in. So you live the commandments, not because you're, you're trying to be saved, not like a checklist, but that's what God says. If you love him, this is what you'll do, okay? We reviewed that it's not the Ten Commandments only. All of the commandments are from God. Yes, there are some that are perverted by the Pharisees and this and that. But people say that there's a Mosaic law. There is no such thing as a Mosaic law. There's the law of Moses, which God gave his law through Moses. And it's termed the law of Moses. But it, nothing is for Moses for a certain people. Okay. So as we move forward, I want to leave this seed in your mind. Because the same way that I was persecuted, you're going to be challenged as well. And here's what I want to tell you. Anywhere you see that we're not under law, it's, remember, we tend to take one Bible verse and we're like, oh, look at it right here. See, we're not under law. But when you put it back into the Bible and you read the entire chapter, you'll see that it's for justification. So remember that. When you read that, it's, that we're not under law, you'll see that it's for justification and that's true. Okay? And here's the other thing to put a staple as we move forward and launch out of the feast for tonight. The Bible says in Leviticus 23 to speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. That means a church day. These are my feasts, capital M showing divinity. They don't belong to a people. They don't belong to a nation. It doesn't belong. It's not old. Remember that. That God said, so because you're going to hear people say, oh, that's, that's for, for Israel, that's for this, or that's for that. God says, or Yahweh says, these are my feasts. Amen? Let's go uh, to Colossians 2, 16, 17. The other thing, too, that remember, whatever is in the New Testament, it has to be in the Old Testament. If you find something in the New Testament, the way you can rightfully divide it is if you try to find it in the New Testament. All of the, the feasts and the commandments, all the apostles lived it. They never broke any of these things. It's only the church. And I, you can see it in the videos um, from the past couple of weeks. So this one is the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, which everybody feels extremely comfortable when they read it there. And I want to show you that this is Paul telling the church of Colossae that they are to keep the the feasts. Remember, the feasts are like celebrating an anniversary, selling a, celebrating a birthday. You, you keep the feasts not for salvation, so you can remember God, so you can remember what he's done. So here Paul says, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. You can stay right there. Stay at 16. So here Paul is saying, let no one judge you. If he's saying, don't let no one judge you, then that means that you're doing it. Right? So you cannot judge me for stealing if I'm not stealing. Correct? You cannot judge me for lying if I'm not lying. So if you read this in context, Paul is saying, let no one judge you in food or in drink. Okay? When he says in food or in drink, he's talking about the food and the drink that was already established in the law of God. Remember, the New Testament doesn't exist when they wrote the New Testament. When the New Testament was written, all they had was the Hebrew Bible. So that's why whatever you read in the New Testament, it has to be here because it came from here, right? Like the types and the shadows that we did last week, right? You follow? Okay. So let no one judge you in food or in drink. Or regarding a festival or a new moon or the Sabbath. See, he's saying, don't let no one judge you for the Sabbath. Um, the nation of Israel, their months start at the new moon. 
So he's saying, don't let no one judge you for, for keeping these things. 17. So that means we have to keep it. This is biblical proof. Which are a shadow of the things to come. See, it says, which are a shadow. Not they were a shadow. That's a big difference. If it says it was a shadow, then it makes it seem old. Right? It's saying they are a shadow. Like it's still a shadow. So us keeping the feast now, Jesus is Jesus, Jesus hasn't come for the final time, right? So there's still a time that he's coming. So when he says, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Does that make sense? That's a key word. The word which are versus which were. So that 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 uh, Christianese language of, oh, that's old and things like that. We got to grow out of that. That's that's milk. All right, let's press forward. Osiris, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8. So here we see the Apostle Paul again, which we, we studied this when we went through 1 Corinthians. Therefore purge, out, therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Here's Paul acknowledging that Jesus was the Passover. Amen? Amen. Therefore, let us what? Keep the feast. You should, listen, if I don't celebrate my anniversary with my wife, you see, Jeff made the face. That's exactly what would happen to me. That face is what would happen to me for weeks. If I didn't celebrate my children's birthdays, like these things are for us. When God establishes something on the land, it's not for God and it's not imperfect and it's not old because he's a perfect God. Right? So saying that, oh, uh, the law is old because God made a mistake so he had to make it again. Like, what? That, that would mean that he's not sovereign. That would mean that he's not eternal. Like, that's like my kids telling me that I made a mistake. Like, I never make mistakes. Right, guys? Um, they look at my dad. That's my, my one man band section over there. Um, therefore let us, I brought him specifically for that moment right there. Um, so Paul says, therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay. Now we're going to move forward to, we did the types and shadows of last week. Okay, Osiris, we're going to go through those verses in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Nehemiah. Remember, one of the things I used to say, and maybe you're, you find yourself saying it as well. They're like, oh no, the statutes, the statutes, the commandments, the law, the decree, the ordinances, those are all different. They're not. When you look up the word in the Hebrew Bible, they mean more or less the same thing. It's a divine law. So I want to show you a couple of verses where it's 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 the same it's it's over and over sometimes people try to separate it oh over here it says statutes but over here it says ordinances see we don't have to do the ordinances but we have to do the statutes no it's the same thing okay and it's confirmed when you when you rightfully divide the word and you use a dictionary a biblical dictionary like the blue letter bible app behold the days are coming says the lord when i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and the house of judah Guys, I'm telling you, I learned this this year. I've been a Christian for eight and a half years now. I never knew. I, I saw it in a video once on social media, and I didn't realize that that was the Lord speaking to me years ago. You should ask people, do you know what the new covenant is? Christians. And I highly doubt that they'll tell you exactly what the new covenant is. Not because I didn't know, but because the overall teaching in the church is, it's, it's not, it's giving us, I used to think the answer was, yeah, Jesus Christ died for our sins and I'm forgiven. Like, no, no, that's the result of the new covenant. But what is the new covenant? That's the new covenant. Go back to 31, please. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's the covenant. It's with those two groups. That's it. There's no new covenant for the Gentiles. When you read it in Ephesians, when you read it in, in, um, in, in the book of uh, Romans, 
it refers to a Gentile, but it, it, it refers to you in the sense that you're being brought in. Once you give your life to Jesus, you're no longer a Gentile. You are an adopted son. Not a daughter, an adopted son. That's what the Bible says. You're an adopted son of the nation of Israel. If I adopt Will and he comes to live in my house, he's going to live under my rules. If I adopt Will and he comes into my house and he lives under his rules, he won't be living in my house. You see, you see the power of the commandments? So you become one with the nation of Israel or, um, uh, excuse me, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Remember that the 10 tribes were all dispersed for their disobedience and they were so numerous and they spread so far that we all blended in. And Gentiles just means nations. It, it's not like a Dominican or Puerto Rican or mulatto or whatever. The word Gentiles, it means nations. So everybody's mixed in. So when we come back, we're coming back to the house of Israel, the house of Judah. This is the new covenant, 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. That's the command, the, the, the tablets, the commandments that he gave to Moses. That's the external covenant. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, it says it twice. It says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds. It's the complete law. That's what the new covenant is. That before it was external, it was through Moses, it was on tablets, now it's inside. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. He's basically saying, because my law is inside of you, I'm going to remind myself of you through my, through my commandments as you live them out. Right? Osiris, let's go to Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put in a new spirit within you. I will take out your heart of stone. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit, capital M, capital S, showing divinity. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and my judgments. You see statutes and judgments? They're from God. Does that make sense? So the reason why we have the Holy Spirit is not to speak in tongues. It's not to know if somebody is in the church sleeping with somebody else. It's not to know if somebody's gossiping about you. The number one reason why we have the Holy Spirit is so that we can be reconnected with God, so that we can live His commandments with grace and assistance with the Holy Spirit, okay? And it's a deposit. That's the promise. That's the other side of the covenant. One, it's the law, and the Spirit is a promise. So when Jesus comes back, whoever has, it's like a down payment. When I go to Walmart and I buy this water, they give me a receipt. That receipt says, I have a relationship with you. I purchased something from this store. Jesus purchased, he redeemed us. So people go, dude, the way you're teaching this, you're, 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 you're making people go back into the law. No, no, we were never supposed to be out of the law in the first place. You know what I'm saying? We're not. That's why nobody knows what sin is in the church. That's not sin. Oh, oh, just, uh, yeah, uh, it says right there that what you're doing that's a sin that's a commandment okay and i'm very thankful to um the leadership of this church and, and pastor rafael who brought up a, an interesting point last week where how do you think you give a foothold to the devil when you break a law when you break a commandment when you break a commandment you have given the devil a foothold where does demonic torment come in when you, when you, he has to have, he has to have something that says you, you, that you violated something. You see the, you see the importance of the commandments? So the more commandments you keep, like pastor broke it down, the less the enemy has any access to you. Now, if you don't think that you don't live any of the commandments, and let me tell you something, the Bible says in uh, Revelation 12, 17, that, that in the end of days, the dragon is going to wage war on those who keep the commandments 
Do you really think it's only the Ten Commandments? Do you really think he's going to wage war on the people that are honoring their father and their mother? No, it's more than that. He's going to honor the, the, the devil's going to know that you belong to Jesus because you're keeping the feast, because you're breaking bread, because you're drinking the, the blood of Jesus, because you're, you're walking in the commandments. The commandments are to make you stick out so that you don't look like other people, right? We all, we drive in Massachusetts. We all, we've all road rage. I don't even have to ask, but you stick out, right? I mean, we're a little older now. I'm not, I'm not a road rager as I once was. But, but when you see someone doing stupid stuff in the road, you're like, man, I used to do that. Because it sticks out. The, the, the person that's, that's cutting all the lanes and, and, and going forward. When something is breaking a law, you can tell. Osiris, let's go to 27 or to 28. Uh, then you shall dwell on the land. Wait, go back to 27. Okay, 27, 28. You shall dwell on the land. All right. Now let's go to this uh, Nehemiah 1.7. This is Nehemiah. This is important how it says it here because Nehemiah was when they were coming back from exile. Remember that God kicked out Israel out of Jerusalem for their disobedience and they went into Babylon, right? That's where the book of Daniel and all those things were written. When they were in Babylon and they were coming back, it's in the story, of, uh, the, the teachings of Nehemiah and Ezra and the scribes. This is important that it says it here because he was going back to restore order in Jerusalem. And look at what he says. This is him pleading for, for Israel. He says, we have acted very corruptly against you. Capital Y, showing divinity. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the ordinances, which you commanded your servant Moses. It's all the same thing. Commandments, statutes, ordinances. It's all the same thing. You'll see it in Deuteronomy. We, we saw it last week. So don't be one of those Christians, like me, that used to say, oh, commandments is different from ordinances. No, it's God's law. Remember the line that I drew last week? God's law, when you think of God's law, never think of it as old and new. Remember this line on this board and remember this, these words. God's law, it's continuous. It's endless. It never stops. It's perfect. Osiris, put up... Romans, it's not on the list. Romans 2.18. God's law is continuous. God is perfect. He's holy. There's nothing impure about him. There's no mistakes. Look at what the apostle Paul, look at how he refers to the law and know his will and approve the things which are excellent being instructed out of the law. How can something be excellent and old? How can something be excellent? And Paul in Romans 3.31, he says, faith doesn't make us break the law. We don't break the law. On the contrary, we establish the law. How can you establish something that's old? How can something that's excellent be old? Remember, when, remember, 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 remember. Scripture is continuous. It's a harmonious flow. Nothing contradicts itself. Saying that the commandments are not of God saying these these things that I used to say that it's of Moses that it's not it breaks it breaks the equilibrium of scripture okay it causes it causes a break in scripture so now you're reading something in the New Testament and it's contradicting something in the Old Testament that's a problem because the Bible does not contradict itself so if you are like I was and you say, oh, see, it says we're not under law. Well, that the law is old. Well, then you run into a contradiction when you see these types of Bible verses. Okay, let's move forward. Osiris, now let's go to that, back to the paper. John 17, I mean, John 7, 16 through 19. I have two more verses that I want to show you. And then we're going to jump into the feasts. Jesus answered and said, and Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine. But his who sent me. I just learned that verse last week. That's powerful. Because Jesus is saying, yo, well, uh, the, uh, what I'm doing here, it's, uh, it, it's actually, it belongs to, to our father. That law, it belongs to God. That's what Jesus is saying. My doctrine is not mine. What I'm teaching you in this church, it's not mine. It's God's doctrine. So you have to discern 
and remove me from the equation and make it about you and the Bible. And the way you do that is you cross-reference everything that's being taught in this church. Really, everything that you read everywhere. You should never trust anything that comes out of the mouth of a man. You could trust it momentarily, but you still got to go. There's 30,000 denominations in Christianity. Somebody's lying. I found out today, and it's, he's, he's my mentor, and I, I believe him, but I don't want to believe him. I thought there were 80 documented churches in Lawrence. There's 500 churches in Lawrence. 500, including the Catholics, the Mormons, the, the, the Jehovah's Witness. 500. So I told them, I said, yo, pastor, I'm going to say this tonight on tape. If somebody asks me where it came from, I'm going to say, Pastor Stephen Ortega, and he made a great point. In both of these buildings, there's about 14 churches just right here in both of these buildings. That's not even counting the churches that have multiple pastors in the church. So that's my beef with the Christian community in Lawrence. That's what God has called us to, to, to uncover. <clears throat> How can there be 500 churches in Lawrence and the city is overrun by sex, drugs, and, and hip-hop? No, no, no. Ser seriously, what does that mean? This is what that means. Here's the city of Lawrence. Okay? And then here's 500 churches screaming the name of Jesus. Why is it that 500 churches are not able to impact a community of about 100,000 people? Here's why. the traditions of man there's a barrier over the city of Lawrence if there's 500 churches and there's no power in the community if there's 500 churches and there's no power in the community if there's 500 churches and we're improperly taught the word of God if there's five 500 churches and it's overrun by sex drugs and rock and roll if there's 500 churches and there's still no revival what's the issue religion is the issue that cloud that cloud there's a cloud of religion over the city of lawrence when i found that i said it when the, when i knew there was 80 i said it when i knew there was 80 churches now that i know that there's 500 that's what it is there's a spirit of religion that's over the city of Lawrence that the only thing that can break that is knowledge. It's knowledge of the word of God. I was having a conversation with Pastor and, he, and, and him and I were just like, were just Bible buffs at this point. It should bother you at this stage of the world and of your life. It should bother you if you are in a church environment and something is being done that's unbiblical. It should bother you. The word should mean something to you. The word, it's like me, it's like what I was telling my dad. My dad was the principal of my high school. He ruined my life when I started to be cool. He became the principal of my high school and I was no longer cool. They were like, oh, your last name's Mojica. The principal of the high school is Mojica. Any relation? Nah. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know him. Um, that joke made me lose my train of thought. Sorry, Dad. Praise God. So we must remember that if there's that much power in the Word of God and there's not that much power in the community, then there's a void there. Like, it should matter. Oh, that's what I was going to say. This is basically what Christianity is like, and we're comfortable with that. Who's comfortable with that? No, no, but the pastor's cool. No, 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 but no, no, but the I really like the way the pastor preaches, but he just got a lot of fire. Well, the church is really nice. I mean, they got they got nice seating. 
Well, a lot of souls are being won there. Do you want this? I don't want this. I don't want this. If somebody's telling me that 2 plus 2 equals 5, and I've lived my walk with the Lord thinking that 2 plus 2 equals 5, and some, somebody comes along and says, hey, the Bible says that 2 plus 2 equals 4, I'm out for blood. You know what I'm saying? I'm looking for everyone that told me that 2 plus 2 equals 5, like Jesus when he was flipping tables in the temple. It should bother you when things are not done in order. It should bother you, the, the, the disorder in the church. And if there's ever any disorder in this church, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, that we're supposed to judge one another. Come and tell me, hey, the word of God doesn't say whatever you're doing in the church, it doesn't say that here. With the exception of the Sabbath, which every church falls short of that. We're not supposed to have church on, on Sundays. It's supposed to be on the Sabbath. With the exception of that, pastor and I are running the church, so that is biblical. But there's a lot of people that are okay with this. You know why? Because this, it gets this. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> Prophesy! Oh, yeah! <laughs> and you go home, you go home like this. You go home like this. And then you don't know why you're not growing in the word. You're not bearing any fruit, why your life isn't changing, why you can't get out of sin, because you're going home like this. We got to get, listen, I heard this pastor say on social media, he said, we're so used to emotional messages that now when you preach sound doctrine, nobody says amen. I told pastor, I was like, yo, pastor, when I preach, you got to throw me a couple of amens in the back. Now he overdoes it. Now I'm like, uh, and then Jesus said, he's like, amen. I'm like, yo, you know, the, you know the meme, the meme with the dude at the Celtics game? Yeah, this dude yells, praise God, when I'm like, let's all bow our heads. Hallelujah. <laughs> but, but, but it's true. When you preach sound doctrine in most churches, they don't, even enjoy, they don't even know. Most churches, they don't even enjoy it. And obviously, I'm generalizing. And I'm not saying... Because you, you have to be careful for having ministerial pride. Like, oh, so only KVCC is doing it well and 499 churches are doing it wrong? No. I'm generalizing a, 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 a truth that I see. So we have to find scripture and we must hold teachers accountable. We must hold ourselves accountable and we must seek the truth. You should want the truth. I want the truth. If I'm supposed to be breaking bread and drinking grape juice for Passover and honoring the Lord and eating unleavened bread for seven days and, and rejoicing and having a feast in the church, I want to do that. You know what I'm saying? Um, Matthew 7, 21. Jesus said, my doctrine is not mine. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? That means some of the gifts, the, having the gifts doesn't get you into the kingdom. Cast out demons into your name. Your charismatic uh, walk doesn't get you into the kingdom. And done many wonders. Remember, when you see a church that's doing miracle signs and wonders, don't drink the Kool-Aid right away. We're like, oh, miracle signs and wonders, man. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. You got to do the smell test on churches now. You got to figure it out because the Bible says in the book of Revelation, in the last days, we're going to be fooled by miracle signs and wonders. So miracle signs and wonders ain't it. It's the spirit of the living God. The spirit of the living God. You know what? If you're truly performing that many miracles, go to Lawrence General. When you're bouncing people up off the, off the bed in the ICU, I'm going to say that's a miracle, a sign, and a wonder. But if the miracles that you perform only happen in your church, the devil is a lie. If, if, you, if, you, if you do it in one church and they invite you to another church and nobody gets healed, the devil is a lie. And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. What do you think lawlessness is? Just breaking the Ten Commandments? You really think Jesus is going to say, you didn't honor your father and your mother. Bounce. It's everything. It's all the law. 
Osiris, um, we're going to skip one kings. We're going to get into the feast now. So now we're going to go um, through each feast. We're going to be in Leviticus 23. And we're going to go methodically. Two people called me last week and said they had a question and they didn't want to ask in the middle of class. Always ask. Always cut me off. Raise your hand. Ask. Because when people ask questions, that's when the class, that's my favorite part of a Bible study is when, when the questions are asked. Because most of the time, somebody else has the same question. So does anybody have any questions before we get into the feast? Amen. What's up, mom? No. There's five. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, mom. Is Well, the Bible, God, the Bible says that the teachers, that's why for me, listen, if, if, if <laughs> I don't know how this is going to sound. It's going to sound pretty bad, but I'm going to say it just to exaggerate the point. I'm to the point that if you tell me that I said something incorrect from the Bible, we're having a meeting. Like we're not texting this out. Like you're going to, you're, no, we're, you're, you and my wife and Pastor Brito, we sit in the office and we're going to go through this. Because God says that if I make a mistake, he's calling me out on the, he's calling the teachers. It says the teachers are going to have a stricter judgment. So if you're a teacher, you should be shaking in your bones by telling people that's an old law. Ah, you don't got to do that. Zechariah 14, Zechariah chapter 14, read it for yourself. In the end times, we're going to be celebrating the feast. So they celebrated the feast before Jesus. They celebrated the feast at Jesus, skip the church, and then we celebrate the feast in the millennia. And the church, we don't got to keep that. We got, oh, we got grace. Don't even, don't get me started, man. Um, listen, we must, we must understand that teachers are going to be called out on the carpet first. Teachers have a stricter judgment. And guess what? When you teach it to your kids, you're a teacher as well. Remember that. Hermano Don Sergio. Exactly. What about that? Who has that answer? Brother Sergio asked for the uh, people that are going to be watching online. What about the Jews that keep the law? Keep, keep the feet, all the commandments, but don't have Jesus. Who can give me the best answer for that? It's the same thing. The same way that the Israelites need Jesus is the same way that the Christians need the law. Remember the graph that I drew? Because if they don't have Jesus, that's they you know that I found out today they don't celebrate the feast of first fruits, but they celebrate all the other ones. You know why they don't celebrate the feast of first fruits? Because the feast of first fruits was fulfilled when Jesus was resurrected and got a glorified body. So even the feast that it says in Leviticus 23, 2. That Yahweh tells the nation of Israel, yo, these are mine. They're like, not that one. Because they don't want to acknowledge Jesus. That's why they're in Jerusalem sticking pieces of paper in the wall. Because the Messiah came and the, the law that they studied was right in front of them. And they didn't even recognize it. The law, the living law, the living word was right in front of them. And they didn't recognize it because he didn't look like what he wanted. Because Jesus said... The, excuse me, the Hebrew scriptures said that there was a Messiah coming that was going to restore a kingdom. They thought it was the like a kingdom that they were going to be prosperous here. So when Jesus came and started rebuking everybody for doing all this silly stuff and whipping, whipping people and flipping tables and telling them, yo, you got my people twisted. You ain't getting into heaven and you don't allow them to get into heaven either. What did Jesus say? He said, the kingdom that I'm coming for, it's not even from this world. Like, you're not even on my level, Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. You're so focused on the, 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 the checklist of the law that you missed 
the grace and mercy that was coming so because you couldn't fulfill it anymore. What did he say? Jesus said, the outside of the cup is dirty, but the inside of the cup, excuse me, the, the outside of the cup is clean, but the inside of the cup is dirty. So they had all this law and, 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 and making people feel a certain way. And inside they were desiring a sister. Inside they were sleeping with people. That's why Jesus in the Beatitudes, he came and he brought it full circle. If you're, if you're going to be nasty inside, you're, not, you're never going to live the commandments. If it says thou shalt not murder, but I got a problem with, with somebody, and I'm like, yo, I'm going to kill them. Oh, my God. When I, oh, I would love to kill. Oh, my God. He gets me so mad. How is that not breaking a commandment? But because I don't actually kill him, I'm like, we're good, right? I didn't kill him. And Jesus came to, re to show them the intent of the law. So, Brother Sergio, remember, um, remember this. Sergio asked, what about, that's why Jesus said, if your righteousness doesn't exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you're not getting into heaven. If your righteousness doesn't exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you're not getting into heaven. They were, they, they were masters of the law. Jesus is saying, you got to take it a level above them. Because they had it externally, but they didn't have it internally. Okay? So here are the Jews. And here are the Christians. And here is the kingdom that is coming down. This is what the Lord showed me in a vision. The Jews have the law. And the Christians have faith in Jesus. No, let me do it the right way. The Christians have Jesus. Here's what the Lord showed me. When the kingdom comes down, Jesus is coming back for one people, one church. Do you guys agree? He's coming for a people. He's not coming for the Dominicans. He's not coming for the Puerto Ricans. He's not coming for the people that have faith. He's coming for a people. Here's what the Lord showed me. The Jews have to push toward Jesus. And the Christians have to push toward the law, not for salvation, for sanctification. And in that process, we will be one people. Does that make sense? The Jews don't have Jesus. They need Jesus. The Christians say that the Bible said that we don't have to keep any, any commandments. So we have Jesus, but we don't look like Jesus. Jesus lived the law and he fulfilled the law, not in its completion, because everything is not completed in the law. He said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. Well, the prophets spoke about the coming kingdom. So that's not fulfilled yet. So both parties need to, it's like that cousin from New York that comes over a couple of times a year. You know, you want to hang out with him, but you know he's a little wretched. But then you kind of want to hang out with him because he's a little wretched. You know what I'm saying? But he needs to hang out with you, but because you're a goody two-shoes. You know what I'm saying? And in the middle, you have a, a gathering. That was my best analogy to try to show you what this means because everybody has a cousin in New York, right? Both parties need to meet Jesus in the middle. That's why the Jews, they reject Jesus because Jesus came to, to bring order. They were just living the law. It's not, they, were, they thought they were saved because of the law. The Christians think they're, faith, they're saved because of faith only. Does that make sense, Brother Sergio? Does it, does it really? I don't think so. But you asked, you asked, do the, Christian, do, the, do the Jews get in without Jesus? No. They need Jesus. They still have the commandments. Right? And we have Jesus, but according to Christianity today, we don't have to do anything after that. That's, a, that's an error. That's erroneous. So... Both parties will meet in the middle and become one people. 
If you're grafted in through Romans 11, it says that we're grafted into the tree. Right. But the sanctification is because you want. The other day, my, my dad, we got to the house. I was tired. And as soon as we got to the house, he said, man, I really want a coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. It was like 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. I didn't even take another step out into, from the garage into the basement. As soon as my father said that he wanted a coffee, my next step was going back to the car. Why? Because I love my dad. Because I want, I, he didn't tell me to do it. He didn't say, if you don't do it, I'm not going to love you. I did, it, it, it just came out of me. You know what I'm saying? If you would have said that, I'd probably be like, yo, you, we're going to have to have Bustelo. You know what I'm saying? But she's not here. That's why I'm throwing stones. But you see, and, and right when I did that, because I'm witnessing to my dad as well. He gave his life to Jesus two years ago, and now he's just like us, working out his um, salvation with fear and trembling. And now I used that as I was driving, and the Lord said to me, that's what it is to love me. That you know that I want you to do something, do it. So I came back and I witnessed the dad. I said, Dad, did you see how I just turned? I didn't even think. He's like, Ay, mi hijo, mi, mi, mi hijo. And then I was like, yeah, mi hijo. Mi, mi. You know what I'm saying? That's what it is. That's what we're, it, it should come naturally. You know, so people are like, oh, like, I'm telling you, you mentioned commandments in a church setting and people freak out because we've been taught that the commandments, that they're bad. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, not to love me if you love me amen all right the passover i have 25 minutes i'm gonna go fast but because it's recorded you can go back and watch it but i really want to finish it today because i'm all feasted out i want to get to second corinthians um so the passover the passover is seven feasts the passover is god's deliverance of israel out of Egypt. It's on the 14th day of Nisan. The 14th day, the month of Nisan is the first month of the Hebrew calendar. It's usually April. Okay, so the, the word Passover, it means to pass over. This meal commemorates the Israelites' deliverance from slavery in Egypt. The Lord said to Moses to lead the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. When first confronted by Moses, Pharaoh refused to let the people go, so the Lord sent nine plagues, and on the last one, the Lord said the, the first male of every house is going to die, even the animals. So they had to put blood on the doorposts of their house so that they could be passed over. Now we see blood, and then we see safety, okay? We must remember that when Jesus died, he, the day that he died, he died on the Passover going into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So that night, the Lord passed over the homes with the blood on the doorframe. Obviously, we're not going to put blood on our doorframes right now. Why? Because it was fulfilled in Jesus. Remember the type and the shadow? The blood on the doorpost was because there was going to be a time when there was going to be blood that was going to lead them to safety. That's why types and shadows, it's important to know that. Uh, finally, Pharaoh let the children of Israel go. Passover was to be a lasting ordinance to the generations to come. Jesus ate the Passover. Cyrus, we're going to get ready for all those verses. Jesus ate the Passover with his disciples, saying that he had eagerly passed over, uh, e e eagerly passed over with them before he suffered, and that he would not need it again until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus said that the Passover, the bread and the wine, that we're going to have that in eternity. That's the supper of the Lamb. What would make the body of Christ think that we're not supposed to do it now if we're going to do it with the Lord later on? You're supposed to do it over and over and over so then one day you do it with Jesus sitting at the table and you're like... Oh. Like when you blow in a, baby's, a newborn baby's face and they're like... Uh, like you're like, oh my God, bro, bro. Oh my God, it's happening. It's supposed to be a reminder so then it says in Luke 22, 7 through 16, then the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he said to Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? 
And they said to him, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. So they went and found it, and just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. You see the Passover in the Old Testament and the Passover in the New Testament. When their house had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles and were with him. The apostles lived the commandments and the apostles celebrated all of the feasts. So Jesus was crucified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The, the reason why the Jews don't believe in Jesus is because there is no human sacrifice in the Hebrew scriptures. So when, you, when, Christians, when, Christ, when Christians speak to a Jew and they say Jesus Christ died on the cross... They're like, no, he didn't because it's not in the Old Testament. You see the power of the Hebrew scriptures. But then you see the power of the type and shadow in John 1.29. When Jesus, the next day, he, when John saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. You see the type and the shadow. You see how that connects scripture. Because he told John, referred to him as the Lamb. Now it's like, whoa, there's no human sacrifices but there is sacrifices of lamb. Now that changes everything. Jesus was the, the, the lamb was the shadow. And the reason why they did that is because Jesus was the type. Right? It's clicking now. Amen. Good. Good. Praise God. The Lord's Supper is a remembrance of his sacrifice as the perfect Passover lamb and the fulfillment of the new covenant between God and man. Luke 22, 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. You see, blood in the Old Testament, blood in the New Testament. The reason why you know it's valid in the New Testament is because it's valid in the Old Testament. Now, another Bible verse, which we read it to start the study. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened. For, for indeed Christ, our Passover, type and shadow, was sacrificed for us. This is Paul referring to Jesus as the Passover. Ephesians. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles. See, it's not still a Gentile. Once a Gentile. And the word Gentile means nations. So therefore, remember that you, once a Gentile in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision in the flesh by hands that at a time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel you see that right there that's that goes with Jeremiah you see how scripture matches what did Jeremiah say that we're in two the two groups is the house of Israel and the house of Judah look at right here it's repeated being aliens from the commonwealth commonwealth of Massachusetts the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise you're, if, if, if you're not part of the nation of Israel, you're a stranger to the covenant of promise. The promise is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus comes, the promise is the receipt of the Holy Spirit. Having no hope and without God in the world. Does that make sense? Praise God. Go, always go back and watch it. Right now it's a lot. You're not supposed to remember it. But go back. Every week, go back and watch the tape. Get a cup of coffee and sit and rewind and get your Bible and get your highlighter and connect and cross check everything because it's hard to take it all in in one sitting. While you're doing the dishes, play it. When you're running on the treadmill, when you're cutting someone's hair at your job, put it in your, in your ear and just let it keep playing. Not because it's me, but because it's your church and it's the Bible study. And you want to know if I'm telling you the truth. I could be lying. I could be incorrect. You should know. May the Holy Spirit convict you for not doing your homework. The prophecy of the, okay, uh, the Hebrew prophet Isaiah also spoke of the sufferings of the, of the Messiah in Isaiah 53. Now we see Luke 2.41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. We see the feast still celebrated even by his parents. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Still. No, it's... 41 and 49 when there's a comma. And he said to them, why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? The feast 
were about the father's business. The feasts belong to God. They don't belong to a people. John 19, 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, what I'm doing is by giving you a lot of Bible verses is I'm connecting the feasts with the New Testament. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross. Okay, so now we got Monday. I did this once. I want to do it again. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Therefore, because it was the preparation day. So Jesus, when he died, the preparation day is Passover is the preparation day. There is a full moon every year on the 14th day of Nisan. Okay, Nisan is the first month of the Hebrew calendar. So preparation day was a day before the Sabbath. So I'm going to put a red box around the Sabbath. This is, a key, this is the day of rest for the Lord from, Gen, from Genesis. That's why the Sabbath is such an important day. That's why you can see why the Roman church changed it to Sun Day. So that we're worshiping the S-U-N and not the S-O-N. It's demonic. This is demonic. Every time we don't go to church on a Saturday, we're all sinning. It says it right there. Okay, so what happens is the day before a feast, that day becomes a high Sabbath. So therefore, because, of the, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, confirming what I'm telling you, that it's a high Sabbath. Okay, I'll put HS for high Sabbath. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might not be broken and that they may be taken away, uh, that their legs be broken and they might be taken away. They broke the legs of the thief, but they didn't break the legs of Jesus. And if you look in Psalm 22, it says that his bones were never broken. So the two thieves' ankles were broken, but because Jesus was already dead, none of his bones were broken, which it says it in the Hebrew scriptures that his bones weren't broken. Right, right. It, it, was, it was a gruesome death. That's why when people go, oh, it's, you know, just, that's my cross to bear. Do you know what the cross really means? People wear the cross around their neck and sleep with somebody else's wife. Do you know what the cross means? You see people wearing crosses all the time. Or the rappers and everything with the Jesus piece. That's what the Pharisees did. They lived it on the outside, but in the inside, the cup was dirty. Um, so anyway, it was a preparation day. So the Passover, the preparation day was to, to get ready for this day because the, the Sabbath, you cannot work. So remember, Jesus said, the only sign that I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah, which was three days and three nights. We saw on the, the Hebrew clock that Jesus died, I believe, is the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. So when he died, they had to take him off of the cross. That's where, that's why Good Friday, it doesn't match. Because Good Friday would be one night, two night. And then Easter Sunday, which is a bunch of hogwash. That's a lie. It has to be three days. So it's one, two, three nights. One, uh, one two, three days. That's why he was raised on the Sabbath because he's the Lord of the Sabbath and then when he was raised on the Sabbath, he left the tomb on the Sunday, which is the Feast of First Fruits, which was when he got the resurrected body. So then the way you count Pentecost, I'm jumping ahead, the way you count Pentecost, it's the Bible says in Leviticus 23, you count seven Sabbaths, which gives you seven times seven, 49. And the Bible says add a day, it's the 50th day. So you add one day, that's why Pentecost always falls on a Sunday. So Jesus fulfilled the Passover, Jesus fulfilled it right here. Okay, that's one feast, the Passover, he fulfilled it. 
Then on this day, the high Sabbath, this is the feast of unleavened bread. You be unleavened bread. For seven days, the Bible says, you're supposed to have a feast. On the seventh day, you have another holy convocation, meaning church. So you, we're going to have church on whatever, I know what day it lands on, but for this sake, we have church. Like the way we have church on a Sunday, you have church. You have a celebration. You have a feast. You eat bread for seven days. And then on the seventh day, you come back again. So Jesus fulfilled the Passover. Jesus fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let's go into some of those uh, Bible verses, Osiris. Can you go right? Can you jump down? Forget it. He fulfilled the Passover. He fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He fulfilled the, um, the first fruits because he was the first resurrected body. And he fulfilled the... Pentecost, which was the day that he was resurrected. Those four feasts, they've already been fulfilled. So when people go, well, what's the big deal of the feast? What do you mean? Uh, the Feast of Weeks, which, is, which is, ends up being Pentecost later on. Those feasts, seven feasts, four have already been fulfilled. We're going to see the other three be fulfilled. So now let's go to the second one, Unleavened Bread. It's mentioned as a separate day on the 15th day. So this is the 14th day. The unleavened bread is the 15th day. This is all in Leviticus 23. Today, however, the feast of Pesach, or, which is Passover, unleavened bread, or, and first fruits, they, they say it all together because this one is in the night. Passover is in the night. You have a meal, you have lamb, you have wine, you have bitter herbs to get ready for this day. So... You, and the other thing, too, about the unleavened bread is, is that, did you know that unleavened bread, it has to be poked? It has to be burned? It has to be seared? You know, Jesus was poked. The bread was poked. The reason why Syrian bread, when you eat it at Brother's Pizza, it has the brown marks on it, it's, it's symbolic of the wrath of God that Jesus endured. That's why it's, this, 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 this symbolism is to help you remember that Jesus Christ died for your sins. It's not, for, it's not, God is not saying to do this because he's wicked. The Bible says his commandments are not burdensome. And yes, the feasts are commandments. Um, okay, in scripture, uh, leaven represents sin. So that's why Syrian bread, it doesn't have any leaven like wonder bread. And the reason why it doesn't have leaven is to symbolize that when God told Israel that they were leaving Egypt, it was, in, it was in a haste. So they didn't have time to bake the bread. But leaven is also symbolic of sin. That's why Jesus is the unleavened bread. No sin. Osiris, let's go to, let's jump and let's go to Luke 12.1. Unleavened bread is a symbol of the Passover. Leaven represents sin. Let me know when you can get that up. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, sin. Okay, we already read um, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8. Remember, I'm going quickly, but it's because you can go back and you can listen to it. Just for right now, just, just, just enjoy just a moment and then go back and research, please. Jesus is the only human without sin and said that he was the bread of God who has come down from heaven and gives life to the world and that he is the bread of life, that the bread that came down from heaven, the living bread, which a person may eat and not die. John 6, 32. And then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. You see why Jesus identifies with bread. He's the bread of life. We've all heard that. Because of the unleavened bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. I am the bread of life. All right, and then we already read um, Colossians 2.17, which it says, Do not let anyone judge you for keeping the feast. Let's go on the night of Passover. 
the father of the house, the, what they did at the night of Passover is they removed all the leaven from their house like a spring cleaning. Acts 12, 3. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. I'm trying to show you that what happened in the Old Testament is happening in the New Testament. The apostles lived these feasts. And it's important because it helps you remember God. It's not, it's not, it, 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 keeping the feast is not a holiness issue. It's a, I want to remember God issue. Um, but we all sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. Where we stayed seven days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? Pressing ahead. The first fruits, which the Jews don't celebrate because they don't acknowledge Jesus, but they will. People offered the first fruits of barley to the Lord. So they went in a field and they grabbed the sheath of, of, of wheat and they tied it and they gave it to the Levitical priest and the Levitical priest would wave it and offer the first fruits to the Lord. That's what Jesus is. He is the first resurrected body. It's a harvest, right? We've all heard that the Lord's harvest. That the Lord is harvesting souls. Jesus is the first and only resurrection. Nobody has a resurrected body. Nobody is in heaven. When we see people post pictures on Facebook and they say, oh, little Johnny, he's in heaven. Little Johnny is not in heaven. Okay? And I'm not trying to be um, uh, uh, harsh for anyone who has lost a loved one. We're just understanding truth. And the, the Bible confirms it because it says that we have to put off immortality. I mean, Put off mortality and put on immortality. You cannot enter heaven until we have a glorified body. Flesh and blood cannot go into the kingdom. Amen? Okay, Osiris. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 25. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits. That's the feast. He became the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Nobody dies. We go to sleep. For since man, since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. If you don't believe in, in Adam, it's impossible for you to believe in Jesus. But it, because Jesus is a type of Adam, which is a shadow. But each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, which is a feast. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. That means that when Christ comes... That's when, when the church leaves. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority. For he must reign until he put all his enemies under his feet. Jesus is the resurrection. He's the promise for future believers. Go ahead, Osiris. Uh, John 5, 28. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And come forth. Those who have done good. To the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation nobody's in hell nobody's in heaven everybody is asleep what happens is when the coming of christ comes there's going to be two sounds you're going to hear people that are going to go jesus what and the other sound you're going to hear is jesus oh that's what that means Two people, two types of people, rich, famous, poor, fat, skinny, sick, black, white, Democrat, Republican, none of that's going to matter. The only thing that's going to matter is what it says right here. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That's why Easter, which is the, which is, it's, it's really the, the, his resurrection Easter is very demonic because it distracts you from that feast. And, and this is what the Bible's talking about. We don't have a problem celebrating Christmas. We don't have a problem celebrating Thanksgiving. We don't have a problem celebrating Easter. We don't have a problem celebrating the 4th of July. But we do have a problem celebrating the feast. Why? Those are the traditions of men. When Jesus said, yo, you, you guys, you guys... You guys do the traditions of men. You, you, don't, you don't do the commandments of God. That's what he's talking about. 
We just had all had Thanksgiving. Everybody here did something for Thanksgiving. Honored it in some way. How can we turn around and then say to God, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'll do the turkey thing, but I'm not going to do the seven-day leavened bread thing because that's an old law. You see the, you see the, you see the trickery of, of Scripture? My mom just says she's been in, in, in the church for 30 years and nobody's ever talked about the feast. The church has missed the mark. And God, you're going to see this more and more. More and more, you're going to see it presented to you. Um, Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Oh, this is the one I did. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For Jonah was three days and three nights. Three days. If Jesus died on Good Friday, that's one in the night. So that's one, two. So this Friday and, and, and good anything that's it's Good Friday or, or Sunday or whatever, that's all a lie. Because it doesn't fall into that miracle. Yeah. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go just a little later today because I really want to finish all of this I see you sis well it's not a it's not a salvation issue if you follow the feast or you don't follow the fe the feast it's, it's not like well you didn't keep the feast so you're gonna go to hell that's not what it is it's that you sh sh like that's that shouldn't be our thought our thought shouldn't be what happens if I don't do it our thought should be God says to do it. Let me do it. How do you think you get fruit? How do you think you get spiritual fruit? By handing out waters in the park? When the Bible says faith without works is dead, what do you think that is? Faith, what do you think works is in faith without works? Rubbing people's feet in the park that are homeless? No. The works is walking the commandments. Faith without works is dead. You cannot remove faith and commandments you can't we tried to but you can't we're like no no i got faith no well if you got faith show me that sh i will know that you believe by you keeping the commandments amen so it's not a holiness issue it's a sanctification issue okay sanctification is the soap the sanctification is how you become like jesus we just saw the apostles kept the feast the apostles wanted to be like jesus sis Jehovah's Witness? I'm not sure I'm um, too much. Well, the I haven't studied the moon phases, but I'll tell you what. The moon phases are how the Jewish calendar is determined. Every new month, which we're going to see in the Feast of Weeks, the new month is symbolized by the new moon. The end of the month is symbolized by the full moon. Remember that Passover every year, which we're going to do it this year, every year on the 14th day of Nisan, there's a full moon. I find that so fascinating because it connects us with the, with the celestial bodies. It connects everything. Um, I don't know much about the Jehovah's Witness calendar. What I do know is, is, the, is if that they don't repent from that false doctrine, they risk uh, perishing in hell because that's a demonic doctrine anything that says that jesus is not god they'll tell you everything the, uh, the muslims they'll tell you jesus was a prophet they'll tell you jesus performed miracles they'll tell you everything jehovah's witness they'll tell you but they will not tell you that jesus is god that means that's what we need to identify it was god who killed god who was resurrected by god it was god the father as one in jesus the son and in the holy spirit that's why the Holy Spirit also has to be God, and they don't believe that the Holy Spirit is God. But in Scripture, it's capital H, meaning He, so it personifies the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is not God, we're all going to hell. This is a waste. That's why Paul says in the book of Corinthians, if Jesus didn't die and resurrect, we're done. If Jesus didn't fulfill the law, you're wasting your time. So that's why when you hear these other doctrines, that's what I tell Jehovah's Witness. If Jesus is not God, you're going to hell just like me.
I love debating with them. Because in, in Isaiah 9.6, it says that he's the father, the counselor, and the, and the uh, 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 mighty God. So uh, did you know that the Jehovah's Witness, I'm telling you this, you know that the Jehovah's Witness, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work here? You see the power of understanding the Old Testament? Every time you debate with a Jehovah's Witness, they just, they, they, it, it, it's, I don't know the saying in Spanish, like, you know, predicando en la bañera. I don't really know what that even means, but like preaching to the choir, right? You, you cannot stay in the New Testament to prove the New Testament. It's like you asking me if I'm cool. Like, yeah, I'm cool, bro. Like, I'm the man. No, no. Ask somebody else, is he cool, so that you can have a point of reference. So Jehovah's Witness, they never, I've never run into one, and I love debating them. They never quote this, because this is what wrote this. So when they read this, if they don't reference this, then they twist it. Oh, because Jesus says in chapter 14 in John, I'm not the father, I go to the father. In the same chapter, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So is that a contradiction? In the same chapter, no. Remember that Jesus was in human form. He was 100% human and 100% God. So sometimes Jesus speaks from the human form. Father, let this cup pass me. I don't want to do this, but if it be your will. You see, he spoke sometimes from his divine from his, div from, from his divinity standpoint, and he spoke sometimes from his human standpoint. That's why the book of Hebrews says that he's 100% human and 100% God. Remember, Jesus, it's, it's Jesus the baby and Christ the anointed of God because spirits need a body to live inside of it. Right? That's why he's Jesus Christ. That's why when Jesus got the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit took him to the wilderness. The Holy Spirit didn't take the Christ to the wilderness to test the Christ. He took the Christ, took the Jesus to the wilderness to test the Jesus in front of the devil that the Christ was in him. Right? So that Jesus could withstand. That's why he didn't eat for 40 days because he, he had the Christ in him. That's some meat, right, Brother Sammy? <laughs> Guys, listen, I just, I want to ask for a favor. Please, I just want to finish this, and I'm going to go a little longer, but I don't want to, I don't want to do the feast next week. I want to go into 2 Corinthians. So just, just, it's 8.20. We're supposed to stop at 8.15. Um, forgive me. The Feast of Weeks, okay? The Feast of Weeks starts after the Passover, after the beginning of of the unleavened bread and you count seven days the feast of weeks is embedded inside of the seven day celebration the feast of weeks is when you count seven weeks when you count seven weeks that and then it says in Leviticus 23 add a day the word pent means 50 so Pentecost is the 50th day, it always falls on a Sunday. Amen? So Jesus fulfilled those first four feasts. So that feast, the feast of first fruits, is when the harvest in April, when the harvest started growing and they gave God the first fruits. In the Pentecost, is when the harvest has almost come to its fulfillment and you give now a bountiful harvest. Jesus fulfilled those first four um, feast. So that's the Feast of Weeks. Now we go to the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Weeks has not been complete, uh, has not been fully completed yet. No, 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 that one was completed. It's the Trumpets, the Atonement, and the Tabernacle. Okay, the fifth one, the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets, it's also the Day of Atonement. It falls on the 10th day of, of the seventh month, I believe. Um, the, tr the blowing of the trumpets on the first day of the month was symbolic. Now, we know that when, when, when Paul says that when the church is caught up, the word rapture doesn't exist. When the church is caught up, a trumpet is going to be blown. Where did that come from? It came from the Feast of Trumpets. You see, what's in the old is in the new. So Joel 2.1. 
Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. That's why that doctrine that says that Jesus is going to come and get the church, Jesus is going to come twice. There's no way in scripture that says that. The apostles never said that Jesus comes twice. Paul says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Some people say the twinkling of an eye. That's what I thought, that Jesus could show up whenever. No, it means that when all of this happens, it happens in the twinkling of an eye. Some people are not going to face death. Some people are just going to be caught up. Like you're going to be walking to the store and boom, and you get caught up with the, with the dead in the air. For the trumpet will sound, feast of trumpets, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. You see how important the feasts are? And we shall be changed. The Feast of Trumpets has not been fulfilled yet because it's fulfilled here. First Thessalonians, for the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. That's the millennial reign. That's when they blow the shofar. The sixth feast feast the day of atonement this is the day that the high priest makes atonement for sin the most solemn holy day of the jewish people atonement means reconciliation of god and humankind when jesus christ died on the cross that was the atonement it was a ransom he paid for that he paid for our sins so the high priest would kill the animal and then go into the holy of holies and sprinkle blood we don't have to do that anymore because Jesus did it. Somebody said to me, do you realize you're telling your church that you have to kill goats? I said, do you realize that you're not even paying attention? I sent him a clip of me saying that we're not going to kill goats after he said that. And he never even said anything after that. Remember, I also got a phone call that somebody gave me a loving warning. And somebody said, yo, if you're not ready to feel the heat for teaching about the commandments of God, you should stop because it's going to get very difficult for you and your church. And you know what? And my wife was in the car, it was on speakerphone, and we both heard it. It was the day after this brother started persecuting me. And I smiled because God is good. When you're doing something for God, He has a miraculous way of going. Come on, come on, come on. God will always confirm when it's from him. He'll confirm it and he'll pull you and he'll bring you. But what happens is the devil, he doesn't want us to know that we're supposed to be doing this stuff. Because if you don't know, you're like my mom, 30 years in ministry. What? But if you know this and you apply it to your life as a church, that's why there's so much power in this church. It's not me. It's, it's, it ain't Pastor Brito. It ain't Osiris. It ain't anybody. It's God through the word because we're reading the word and we're examining it and we're studying it. That's why somebody got delivered this morning at six o'clock in the morning. The brother just boom. He just fell and he got delivered right in the morning prayer. That's the second time somebody's been delivered straight by the Lord here in the morning from an addiction. That's power. I never seen it. You know why I never seen it? Because there's 500 churches in Lawrence. I never seen a deliverance. I never seen a deliverance in any church for miles until I opened this church. And I know it's because we're doing this. And I want the fire. I want the smoke. You should want the tougher road. You should want the difficult life. You should want the you should want to walk alone if you're going to walk if you're going to walk in a crowd, you're probably not doing the will of God. You should want to be persecuted. The Bible says persecute. If, if uh, blessed is he who's persecuted for my name's sake. God says that because that happened to me for those two weeks, he's like, yo, you, I, I like that. Because we get the devil. He loves to bring a fire because we're so afraid of fire. Like we just want to be like, we just want to be stable in everything that we do. No, blaze a trail for God. You're only here for 70 years. The Bible says you're here for 70 years. Anything over that is the strength of the Lord. My father's 76. He's living six years off of the strength of the Lord. You should want to be 
the, the pioneer in your family. You should want to be different. You should want to search the scriptures and live them. It should, it should come out of you. I don't, want, I don't want to do anything easy for God. I don't, want the, I don't want to just have people come to church and put a couple of dollars in the change bin and we hand a little couple of cheeseburgers out in the park and we got a nice little children's program. No! We're casting out demons and we're healing the sick. We're advancing the kingdom of heaven. We're preaching the word of God. We're operating in the gifts. I want them all. Forget speaking in tongues. You can speak in tongues all you want. I want them. Bow! 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 Like, I want the miracles. I want the signs. I want the wonders. And when you get that, it comes with the fire. So the fire is your friend. The fire is your friend. The fire lets you know you're going in the right direction. Because if you feel the fire now, you'll feel the glory later. You feel the glory now, you'll feel the fire later. So I'd rather burn now and know that I'm going to rest with Jesus than to, than to have some fake glory through a tradition of man getting patted on the back by men because I'm preaching 2 plus 2 equals 5. If I preached 2 plus 2 equals 5, this church would have been packed. If I was preaching with Gucci belts and Mercedes Benz and all of this designer clothes, this church would be packed. But when you're telling people to repent, when you're telling people to live the commandments, to pick up your cross, people are like, this church sucks. I ain't going over there. That's what you want. That's what you want. Okay. Christ came as, Christ came as the high priest. So we got the Feast of Weeks, the Day of Atonement. Um, there's other scriptures there. I'm just going to say them so you can research them. Luke 23, verse 44 through 46. Hebrews 9, 11, verse uh, excuse me, 11 through 28, um, being justified in Christ, uh, Romans 3, verse 21 through 25, Romans 11, uh, verse 26. And then the last one, the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles commemorates the 40-year wilderness. Let's go to um, the, the Feast of Tabernacles is when you make a tent outside and you live in the tent for seven days. Now, here's the thing, is that that feast, according to Nehemiah 8, you're supposed to celebrate it in Jerusalem. What happens is, if you want to do it, people make a tent here in their backyard. Like my mom's friend, we call her Shabbat. She, she has a tent that she lives in outside for seven days, and that commemorates when the Jews were in the wilderness. Well, I found out today in Nehemiah 8, it says that that's when you're in Jerusalem. You can do it here if you want, but it's when you're in Jerusalem. But I want to live this so bad that I already had this spot in my yard where I was like, yo, I'm going to buy. I was on Amazon looking at the Sukkot tent. I was like, yo, I'm going to get a TV and this thing, everything. You know, I'm like, Eunice, you're going to have to come out here. But that's why it's important to rightfully divide the word because I kept researching it and I found out that that's for the people that are, um, that are in Jerusalem. Um, in actual Israel. Okay, so that's the last one is the Feast of Tabernacles. And here's the last thing I'm going to tell you. It truly is the last thing. Zechariah 14, verse 16, 18, and 19. Let us all stand, please. So somebody's going to say to you, you go to a church and they tell you to keep the feast? That's a false doctrine. We don't have to do that anymore. Well, Zechariah is an end time prophecy. It says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came to Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, capital K, showing divinity, the Lord of hosts, which is Jesus, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So during the millennial reign, after we get caught up and we get a glorified body and Jesus is sitting in the temple it, it physically, He's phys it's not a spiritual thing. It's a physical sitting in the temple. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15 verses uh, 23, 24, and 25, it says that he's going to reign until all powers are under his feet. We reign with him. While we reign with him, we live the, 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 the feast. And the Bible says once we get caught up, there is no more salvation. So we judge the other homies that didn't 
that didn't die, that they're living now, and all of them, according to Scripture, that don't come up to worship Jesus in Jerusalem, a plague will fall on them. So we're going to live the feast in the end times. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, capital K, showing divinity, the Lord of hosts, on them will be no rain. Osiris. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, we thank you for what you have done in our midst. We thank you that you've taken us down this journey with the feast. Lord, we thank you that we know that the feast is not something of holiness, Lord, or salvation, excuse me, for salvation, but it's more so that we can be holy like you are holy. Lord, we thank you for truth. We thank you for this church. And we thank you, Lord, that you're going to convict all of the people that are part of this church who don't research what they're being taught. Lord, help us to seek your truth and not the traditions of men. Help us to break the things that we've learned that were improper and help us to download the proper software that you've given us. Lord, we love you. And we know that if we love you, we will keep your commandments. That's how you'll know that we are yours. We thank you, God, for this church. We thank you that this is the last Bible study of the ministry year. This is the last one. We've gone one year having Bible studies. And man, have we learned, God. We learned that we need you. We learned that your word is an everlasting word. We learned that your law is eternal. It's excellent. It's perfect. It's upright, Lord. And we just thank you for all of it, God. We thank you for the growth of the church. We thank you for the pain and the glory. We thank you for it all. But Jesus, we want more. We want more of your glory. We want more. We don't want to call for persecution, but we know that we will be persecuted for your name's sake. Blessed is he who is persecuted for your name's sake. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen.